Um, Kevin changed my mind about online and distance learning. Uh, I've been uh, an anti-advocate for the last few years of the School of Visual Arts because I want, I like the touch and feel of teachers. Uh, not in the erotic sense. <laughs> uh, I was asked to talk about history. So I'm going to talk about design literacy and history of design. But uh, I'm going to ask you a, a very complicated question first. What is the color of George Washington's white horse? <laughs> and it's rhetorical, so you don't really have to answer. But it's surprising to me how many kids are stumped by this silly grade school riddle. In fact, how many of you have taken open book tests and missed the answer that's right in front of you? My worst test scores, and my test scores were pretty bad all around, came from open book exams. I speculate that a fairly high percentage of kids don't do well with tests where the answers are right in front of their noses, because it's hard to believe it's that easy. Along these lines, I asked a handful of undergrad design students to tell me who invented pasteurization? <laughs> who invented the diesel engine? Who invented the Ford automobile? Who invented the Dyson vacuum cleaner? And more close to home, who invented Windsor Newton Inc? Or Higgins Inc? And the big stumper was who invented Doc Martin's shoes. <laughs> Curiously, the response was not all that encouraging. Despite the inventors or founders' names hiding in plain sight, they had no clue. I suppose that each of these are so much a part of our brand vernacular that their inventors, not to mention the, uh, other facts, were distorted or obscured by prevaricated brand narratives. Brands usually come with pre-digested histories appended to their respective identities. Corporations pay millions for naming and packaging campaigns that perpetuate Ford or introduce Dyson as household names. Over time, when a brand story is well managed, consumers totally embrace the false narratives. I, for one, believe that Dr. Pepper went to medical school. Kids today seem to be more visually literate than ever before, but nonetheless gullible and susceptible to brand speak. They are more willing to accept the fake brand stories of products that they own or aspire to own than they do the real history of, say, automobile mass production. Perhaps there are even some that don't know who George Washington is, no less the color of his trusty steed. How do we educate these kids to be more discerning? I contend that history is the glue that binds our liberal arts education together, and design history is the thread that ties it, or if you prefer, contextualizes design practices within the larger world. And that means understanding everything, from branding to ergonomics, to visual style, to communications technologies, and more. History needn't be musty like a closet filled with molding memorabilia. History is filled with large and small revelations, wonderful connections and insightful discoveries. For example, here's a little factoid. The real Dr. Martens, spelled differently, who created Doc Martens boots and invented a revolutionary air cush cushion sole, uh, was serving in the Wehrmacht during World War II when he realized he needed better shoes. He is in, and his product is an array of other products like the t-shirt, spam, that delicious delicacy, and molded plywood that were born of war, yet put to peaceful use. Now, tell me that isn't fascinating, or at least moderately fascinating, or at least somewhat interesting. At least it's not boring. Now, if you're following my logic, which uh, I give you a point for, because it confounds me from time to time, this is actually a preamble for a proposal on teaching design literacy pre-K through 12, wherein correlating history is an essential virtue. Design history through K, K through 12? Are you, I mean, am I insane? 
After all, it's hard enough getting my grad students interested in the history of design, when what they really want to do is create the next big app, unless, of course, the next big app is about design history. <laughs> so, would you like to know how design history can be integrated into kindergarten through 12th grade curriculum? Anybody? Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, to be honest, it can't. So I won't even try. Goodbye. <laughs> Just forget about history until ninth grade or thereabouts, until it's truly necessary, and then it will be the gift that keeps on giving. Pre and primary school is the period when kids should be encouraged to conceive and make art while being exposed to design, and to learn that creativity and imagination have a place in our social order. I presume at this conference you'll hear more about this, so I'll continue with my proposition. By the time kids reach high school age, they are mature enough to be informed and nourished by, and thus appreciate, what came before. To study history is a process of excavation and building story upon story. In art and design in particular, it's about seeing, rejecting, embracing, and changing what once was. History is the engine of creativity. In high school, a history design class should complement art and design practice and be seamlessly woven throughout the studio periods, whereby, for instance, every assignment is linked to and reveals a historical parallel. This is common in college design classes where particular past styles, movements, or attitudes are studied and scrutinized, and then students interpret what they've learned in the studio through drawings, prototyping, or what have you. This class spans the disciplines as well. Design production and design history incorporates graphic, package, product, interior, architecture, motion, data, advertising, illustration, design, and more. High school students should receive a full array of these design options. And with so many means of production available to anyone with access to hardware, the range of what could be physically made rather than merely sketched has become even wider. I'm going to show you a short film of one of my former uh, grad students that could easily have been done at the high school level, which is not a criticism of the work, but it is saying that m the media is available. It combines historical research, motion graphics, and sound design, a combination of academic and studio work. It's based on the content of one of my books, Typology, and this student found the means to survey t the typographic landscape and history while making an entertaining video that may influence others to do the same. We need sound. Oh. Excuse me one oh. second. Here we go. Is it interesting? Yes. Is it a way to teach students about typography? Yes. Because they have to do the research, and then they have to do other things. They have to find music. They have to make the motion happen. They have to make the rhythm work. So it's a way of engaging the student in such a way that it's not just a didactic uh, lecture. For my proposition to make sense, however, it's essential that an art and design literate teacher lead this kind of class. 
someone that could make studying <clears throat> the most boring technical subject exciting. It won't be our Miss Brooks. It won't be Mr. Cotta. And it certainly won't be Breaking Bad's uh, star. <laughs> that combustible mixture, mixture of artist, designer, teacher who views art and design as equal is rare, but they do exist. In fact, I'd like to introduce you to one right now, who is, as far as I'm concerned, his own chapter in the history of design education and the model for doing so over 80 years ago. He's uh, doing then what I'm proposing today. Those old guys stole our best ideas. Leon Friend began his teaching career in 1930, in the throes of the Depression in Brooklyn's Abraham Lincoln High School, where he was the first art department chairman. Abraham Lincoln will never be as famous as the Bauhaus, Ulm, or Cranbrook, nor is it even especially well known amongst most New Yorkers, unless you're a Brooklynite. But for over three decades, between 1930 and 1969, it was a springboard for scores of artists, photographers, and graphic designers Friend's curriculum balanced the fine and applied arts and offered more commercial art courses than most art trade schools. He introduced leading contemporary designers and inspired many of his students to become designers, art directors, illustrators, typographers, and photographers. For most of us with limited economic resources, explained a former student from the class of 48, the career choice was to drive a cab Thanks to Mr. Friend, we could earn a living and be challenged by working with type and image. A partial list of his students includes Seymour Quast, uh, Alex Steinweiss, who invented the record cover, Bill Taubman, who created the famous Levy's Jewish Rye commercial, uh, Gene Federico, who formed two advertising agencies during his lifetime, Richard Wilde, who runs the uh, undergrad program at the School of Visual Arts, and Sheila de Bretfield, who runs the graduate program at Yale. Fr Friend accomplished in high school, in the high school environment, what was not devoted, that was not devoted to art studies. It was a regular general high school. What many colleges and universities fail to do today he placed the applied arts in both an historical and practical context. From the ninth grade, his students were taught typography, layout, and airbrush techniques, while other schools were teaching crafts. They art directed and designed the school's journal here, Cargos, and it looked as professional as anything that was out on the market. The title of his class was called Graphic Design, long before it was a common term. But the term was defined broadly. His students drew and painted, designed posters, and composed the magazine and book pages. And for Friend, graphic design was an all-inclusive and expressive activity. One of his students said, we were taught honestly in design and application, clarity of thought and presentation, and fidelity of concept and rendition. Friend's curriculum was more than a departure from standard cookie-cutter New York City Board of Education pedagogy. It, challenged, it was a challenge to the common assertion that art education was merely ethereal. His history classes broadened the knowledge of those who took them. His studio classes forced students to solve professional problems. And his guest lecture classes, including such luminaries as Laszlo Moholy Naj, Lucien Bernhard, Joseph Binder, Lynn Ward, Chaim Gross, and Moses Sawyer, offered an introduction to the masters of commercial and fine art and show their connection. Friend's midterm and final exams required that each student be versed in how and where the intersection of the histories of fine and applied art defined culture. And some of the questions were quite provocative for kids in high school. Like this one, what is the essence of good lettering? It's a question that could still be asked today. What other high school's test paper included questions about perspective, using E. McKnight Kaufer or A.M. Cassandra posters as visual examples? The tests show to what extent we, as high school students, were required to comprehend the history of all art and its relationship to industrial, architectural, and graphic design. 
And that's what Gene Federico told me once. He also added, friend inspired me to become an advertising designer. And it was fun. There was a game-like quality to it. Friend wanted his students to have every opportunity to succeed in the real world. And so he founded a quasi-professional extracurricular club called the Art Squad, which for its members was more important than any varsity football, basketball, or baseball team. Participation in this daily, and it was seven days a week, program was limited to 30 students per year representing all the grades. Located in Lincoln's room 353, Friend gave the Art Squad autonomy under the tutelage of an elected student leader who served for an 18-month term. Membership was by invitation and sponsorship of another student and required a portfolio review by the membership committee. Members worked for a common cause and developed personal strengths. Friend entered the teaching profession at a time when graphic design was a potential means to escape economic hardship and that was the hardship of the Depression, and was by necessity an exponent of practical pedag pedagogy, or what one alumnus called the achievement method. By allowing his students a chance to develop at their own pace and discover their own strengths and weaknesses, Friend made an indelible contribution to many lives. Through the years, he received numerous awards and praise from his peers and fellow students. He was also co-author with Joseph Hefter of the first book on graphic design ever published. Friend's practical methods prepared students to enter the profession, but that is a lot to ask of a high school program. Design is a language, not like French or Spanish, but more like Esperanto. While knowing the rudiments of design technique is enough for some, design literacy, which is predicated on historical understanding, is arguably as useful and necessary as any liberal arts foundation. We have a teacher at the School of Visual Arts who in many ways is channeling Leon Friend, although they never met. Kevin O'Callaghan is the chair of 3D Illustration. I'm going to go back, so keep that music in He's the chair of 3D illustration, and he teaches students to make what they have never conceived making before using hammers, nails, paint, wire, as well as history as their raw material. The video that you almost saw, and may see again, shows the install and opening of one of O'Callaghan's string of undergrad and graduate exhibitions that integrate historical contexts with contemporary making, and especially the handwork I described. This one was titled Tall Tales, and it involves building 19 modern-day totem poles that tell stories of and offer critical commentaries of nationalism, crime, corruption, and militarism on the one hand, and on the other, they are monuments to pop culture, like eight-track stereo, vintage Havana, and long-lost carnivals, and the writing of Jack Kerouac as well. It forces the students to investigate various histories, which adds to their con contextualization of the work.
Callahan also teaches a 3D typography class for high school juniors and seniors in the SVA pre-college program. Rather than study the Trajan column inscriptions and classical tenets of typography, which they'll eventually do if they stay interested in art school, he has them create ad hoc alphabets on a specific theme. The history of design is replete with these so-called metaphoric alphabets. And his young students take it to an imaginative and expressive extreme. High school kids are so sophisticated with their media tools that they can do things that some of their teachers are unable to accomplish. This one's called Nerd. But it is a way to get students to uh, look at typography in a real world manner before they get stuck with the rules and regulations. Actually, I think this one's called Nerd. The other one was called Bully. I show um, uh, high school kids are so sophisticated, as I said, with their media tools that they do things that are uh, rare in the classroom, uh, what's something the teachers are not able to do, and I find this all the time that the students are teaching me. I'm going to show a, a video again done by one of my graduate thesis students for one of his projects for two reasons. The first is that it looks at a genre of type that is ignored by the design canon. The second is it takes a student who grew up in these uh, forms to appreciate them and make them into history. The medium that he's dealing with, you'll see in a moment. into history by being a fan of video games, the early video games, and wanting to chronicle the way typography was used in those games when they were bitmapped. He created what actually amounted to a book, a historical book, on the evolution or devolution of that design form. Admittedly, with all, th all the three R's and then some in high school, carving out time for design education seems low on the pr priority list. At least that's the belief of those who short-sightedly manage the budgets. I contend, and I know I'm preaching to the choir, that design education is liberal arts education from the back door. In addition to tests of talent and skill, exercising the imagination, appreciation of history, and how it plays into art and design practice, design offers lessons in ethics and intellectual property. Historically des designed, uh, Historically, design, designers accepted an amount of routine cannibalizing. See a good idea or style, take a good idea or style. Only in the past 30 years or so was plagiarism even considered bad manners, no less taboo in design. Something like this is perfectly sound practice. Design is one of those of the more ethical professions, so imparting those ethics are a benefit of teaching design at a young age. This is a piece that was done for uh, anthropology, the store, and this is where it came from. Along these lines, what else fits into a design history uh, curriculum that will generate conversation and appreciation at an early age? Since, my world does, since in my world, design history is woven into a studio environment, design history is a lens through which to explain what design has been and will be. And these are some of those things. Design is building upon recognizable cultural imagery while finding ways of transcending time and place. So this is something that a high school kid could be taught easily and visually vivid. Piece of history 
and how it was used by a hip publication. Design is about being playful in all sorts of ways. And the visual pun is a tool of design that allows the designer to express many messages in one image. As you can see, Herb Lubalin's families is a very clever idea that also becomes a mnemonic, you can't forget it. Uh, Let My People Go, uh, which dates, dates the piece somewhat, uh, refers to Soviet Jews leaving the Soviet Union. Design is an expressive tool. Sure, it's in the service of a client, but it can also be the means to make a personal statement or a social commentary. Here's something that was ubiquitous. Here's something that was sadly in the news. And here's an interpretation of both. Design is also about quoting historical precedents, in part because such imagery is familiar, but also there is room for irony. And nothing is more mnemonic than an ironic visual. Famous cover by George Lois. A similar adaptation, but for anti-smoking. A data processing company using data. And just in case you wanted to see where the arrows went, a magazine ad. Design is knowing when an idea is good and not good. Sometimes a good idea can be used so many times it becomes bad, and not in a good sense. And the mouth isn't all that nice when it's open like that. It's knowing when ideas are tired retreads and knowing when and when not to resort to stereotypes. I always ask my students to come up with these connections. What have you seen more than you need to see? It's amazing how much stuff is uh, repeated. So, in conclusion, design is about busting as many conventions and taboos as possible, turning comfort on its side, and if the mood strikes, even changing the color of George Washington's fine and handsome horse, if you want to. Design opens up doors that math and science may open up as well, but in a very different way, in a very engaging way. And I look forward to seeing more of it school system. Thank you very much. Do you want to take some questions? If anybody has a question or a comment, I'm happy to gab. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. I, I see it could be in the same way that children's books introduce uh, the physical world to kids, and toys introduce the physical world. But I have enough trouble with grad students. <laughs> Undergrad students are even more trouble. And high school kids, oh yeah. <laughs> so I've decided to keep this more towards uh, 9 to 12. But yes, I think someone who has the patience of Job, Job had patience. <laughs> Uh, could do it with younger kids. They are indeed, but you know, it, to me, it, seeing the younger kids without the constrictions of, of the past, you know, of figuring it out, out for themselves what it is that they're going to create, uh, that's really a joy. I mean, I found it with my own son, who incidentally couldn't care less at age five, six, seven, eight, and nine, about all the things I had around the house, except that he would like to break them. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes?
What do you think made Leon Friend um, such a standout teacher? Like, what were the qual what, what what was the quality that made him such a standout teacher as opposed to any you know as opposed to today? Is there something? Is it just the time that he was unique, or was there something about him that? Well, everybody who knew him said there was something about him that I guess you could apply to any really good teacher cared about the students, he cared about their welfare. But what was u truly unique is that in a situation where there were standards of curriculum for art and whatever extracurricular there was, uh, he took it to the next step. He brought in Europeans. It wasn't just about the Americans. Um, it wasn't just about painting what you see, the apple in front of you. It was about introducing abstraction. And Early, it was early on before abstract expressionism became part of uh, the artistic vocabulary. Um, so on one level, he, un he also understood the profession. He understood there was a job out there. Most of his students were lower middle class and poor kids. So the opportunities that he opened up for them were unique at that time. And, uh, and he stuck with it. Apparently, he was in the school 15, 16 hours a day. And that was his life. And he did it for from 
Yes, ma'am. I would agree 100%, if not more. My only problem was with teaching design history at too young an age, where, where it feels force-fed, where they don't really understand the connections. There has to be a certain amount of sophistication yeah. so that they're doing collages and they realize, gee, these were done during Dada. These were done during Russian constructivism. I mean, that's the, the only part that I'm yeah. Right. try to sell a children's book today, there's lots of standards. And certain media, certain approaches are just poo-poo. If there was more uh, of a Catholic nature in what could be a children's book, the children will see, the kids will see different media coming to the fore. Well, the librarians now, yeah. I just got through doing a seminar on Maurice Sendak and the taboos that he broke, and the uh, librarians whose arms he had to break. <coughs> yes, ma'am. Okay, we have time for, we have just time for one more question. some wonderful ones out now. There's one on linotype. But these things tend to be um, very specialized. If you can... Uh, the linotype movie I would recommend to anybody because it's a love story, basically. It's a love story about people for a machine. <laughs> well, I have a whole library of <coughs> podcasts online. Uh, if you can stand me for that much time <laughs> there uh, at, at School of Visual Arts and uh, iTunes. Thank you very much. <laughs>